we're, we're harming people physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically. So we're, we, we understand that Plato is right. We're all in search of meaning, but where we fail to find it, we end up with, with young people shooting up schools and people going into uh, churches and shooting up churches and those kind of things because that's the end result. That's the logical consequence of there not being any meaning. If you just follow the, the, the logic through, if there, if there is no meaning, there's no, then that's the natural output. Okay? Let's look at psychology today. I thought some of these were really interesting. Um, psychology today starts off with a quote about science. Isn't that interesting? Psychology today says, the second law of thermodynamics states that the entropy of the closed system, that is, it's winding, that it, things like the universe are winding down, such as the universe increases up to the point at which equilibrium is reached. And God, God's purpose in creating us, and indeed all of nature, might have been no more lofty or uplifting than to, than to catalyze this process in the same way the soil organisms catalyze the decomposition of organic matter. In other words, all we're good for is sort of a, a cosmic fertilizer that, that sets the world in, into uh, a blaze. What, what this really comes down to is that what he's wanting to do is, is evoke science and evoke a god. But isn't it interesting that, that that's what the psychologists are doing rather and trying to, to deal with them in a way that says that they're, they're not only not important, but if they, if they are important, here's what the end result is. That may, maybe, what does he say? What is the exact words? Uh, God's purpose in creating us and indeed all of nature might have been. You see, what, what psychology today is saying is that these things could be this way, but they're not really saying what they are. Now, you're going to see this as a theme all the way through tonight as we talk about other religions. This might have been this way. Well, what he's saying is if there is a God that exists, all he's done in creating us is make us sort of cosmic fertilize, a way to, to bring about the destruction of the earth in the end. Okay, then let's look at, go on with psychology today. If our God-given purpose is to act as super-efficient heat dispensers, which is what he said in the first paragraph, then having no purpose at all is better than having this sort of purpose because it frees us to be the authors of our own purpose or purposes. Now, what is, do you see any problem with that besides <laughs> the obviously end result? Anybody? David? Yeah? Well, they're not only taking God out of the picture, they're putting man in God's place. Okay. The God-given purpose is to act, is, is for us to act as, as sort of, like I said, cosmic fertilized. So he, he's evoking a God, but he's, he's saying that what he would prefer is having no purpose at all. That's the point I wanted to get you to see. Is he's, he's saying these things, but he's not telling you anything other than, isn't it preferable that we just have no purpose? He's not telling you that there is none. He's not telling you that exactly how anything works. He's telling you from a psych psychologist standpoint that he would just prefer not to have a purpose. So he's not giving us any answers, is he? That, that's the point I want you to see. In the end, there's a whole lot of words here, and they're pretty confusing if you try to tie them together, but he's not telling us anything that is, that is definitive. He's just saying, I'd prefer that I'd have no purpose. And then he's going to go on to tell us why. 
Uh, in fact, having no purpose at all is better than having any kind of predetermined purpose, even more traditional ones such as to, to please or serve God or improve our karma. In short, even, a God that exists, even if God exists, and even if he had an intelligent purpose in creating us, and why should he have had, we do, we do not know what, that purpose, what this purpose is or might be, and whatever it might be, we would rather, there's that statement again, we would rather be able to do without it, or at least to ignore or discount it. For unless we can be free to become the authors of our own purpose or purposes, our lives may have, at worst, no purpose at all, and at best, only some unfathomable, potential, trivial purpose that is not our own choosing. In other words, I want to be the master of my own destiny. I do want to be my own God. And I don't want anybody telling me what I, my purpose is. Okay, that, that, that is what we're hearing from a lot of atheists today as well. Just don't tell me that I've got any purpose at all because I don't want to be responsible to anybody. I don't want to have any, uh, any authority over me. I don't want to have anybody telling me what my purpose is. Just let me define it myself. I would say that a lot of people who don't um, class themselves as atheists but aren't believers probably would hold that same thought as well or mm -hmm. something similar. Yep. Okay. Yeah, David. I've also got a question what the, per what the appropriateness of this kind of an article being in a Psychology Today magazine. That's what I say. I think it's extremely interesting that that's in, even in there, let alone that he is evoking some God that he says may have, have some trivial purpose for us, even if it's just being cosmic fertilizer. Uh, and then he, 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 he tries to justify that in the former slide here by starting off quoting the second law of thermodynamics something from science. So what has he really accomplished here other than saying, I'm going to give you my opinion, and my opinion is I don't want anybody telling me what to do. And that, th the reason I wanted to give you this on the front end is what I want, want you to see is this quite often is the position of psychologists and psychiatrists in a secular world all, across, all, all around the world. Is, is because they, they don't want to have any authority or justification for believing in a God. And therefore, I'm okay, you're okay came about. That book some years ago, what was back in the 80s, late 80s, somewhere along, along the way. So, was it 60s? Elvis saying 60s, my, probably. Uh, so, here's, here's the psychology of this, though. You don't let anybody tell you that you're not you're not absolutely ideal. Don't let anybody tell you that you're not perfect. Don't let anybody t give you any dictate of what you, how you have to live. Just live and let live and, and hang loose. It's all okay. That's a deadly thing to be in the hands of psychiatrists and psychologists around the world dealing with people that are hurting and not giving them any answers, but you're okay, it's okay. You don't need to be responsible to anybody else. God does not want us to have the understanding that everything's in our court, but that he does have a purpose for us. But their, their explanation here tries to do away with that purpose. Okay, last little bit on psychology today. Human life may not have been created with any predetermined purpose, but this need not mean this need not mean that it cannot have a purpose, nor that the purpose cannot be just as good as if not much more than any predetermined one. What what the what this psychologist is saying is the same thing we're going to hear from atheists. We'll see the difference between atheism and and uh, and. Uh, thought processes that lead to uh, annihilism, 
Okay, so I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But it, it's, if, if, if what he's saying is, again, I would rather there not be a purpose given to me, but it doesn't mean we can't have a purpose. Atheists say we can have a purpose, but we're, we're going to create it ourselves. It's, it's not something that's predetermined. It's not something that God gives us. It's not something that has any real meaning to it, as long as we're happy with it. This is kind of a tangent, but just as a point of curiosity, the author of this article, does he profess uh, atheism, or do you have, is there any hint of what he... We don't ha I don't have any idea. I, I'd only seen one other ar article by him, and, and it was in Psychology Today, too. And so the meaning of life, of our life, is that which we choose to give it. That's, that's the conclusion. Here's the conclusion. Your life only has meaning that you give it. That's the conclusion of the, of the Psychology Today article. So you choose, you pick it out, go for it. If you're not happy with it, you can change it mid-course just so it's good, good for you and you're happy with it. What, what, pro, what host of problems do you see with any of that? One, and this isn't um, a spiritual one. I mean, the obvious would be that that's not at all what God teaches us. But if I'm somebody who is having real problems with um, self-identity or self-worth or whatever, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever. If the person, the professional that I'm going to, um, this is what I'm being taught. The meaning of life is just what I choose to give it. But if I'm that low or whatever I am, that just kind of, that's no help to lift me up even on a secular level. It's just more damaging. Okay, exactly right. Here, l let me boil it down. With this psychology, there is no right and there is no wrong. Why? Because your purpose can be anything you choose for it to be. It can be shooting up a school. It can be shooting up a church. It can be doing wonderful things, feeding children. It can be anything you want it to be, but there is no right and there is no wrong as long as it is that which you choose to give it. You give your, your life purpose, and whatever that is, it's okay. What it's doing is doing away with, it, with good and evil, right and wrong, anything with moral implications, which is our next week. Okay? You see how one of these things bleeds into the other. This is bleeding into to the morality area. So that if we, if we don't have any right and wrong, and we just choose to make our life purpose anything we want it to be, then nobody has the right to tell you if it's right or wrong. That's the end result of this. And there's the danger, from not only from a spiritual standpoint, but just an everyday living standpoint. How do you know that person you got coming to meet you on the street hasn't decided it's just best to kill every other person that walks down the street? And this is, these are our psychiatrists. Okay, well, point I hope made. So let's look what Einstein says. Everybody wants to think Einstein knows a lot about everything. He seems to. The World as I See It is a, is a book that he wrote, and in the, these are a couple of quotes from that book. What is the meaning of human life, or for that matter, of the life of any creature? To know an answer to this question means to be religious. That's interesting. You ask, does it make any sense then to pose this question? I answer, the man who regards his own life and that of his fellow creatures as meaningless is not merely unhappy, but hardly fit for life. He, he, he understands that, that all those quotes from the first ends up making a person ultimately unhappy when the idea of the psychiatrist and the psychologist is to say, well, just do what you want to do, it'll make you happy. And Einstein's saying, no, it doesn't. In fact, 
He says the person that's of that ilk is not fit to even live. Science without religion, he says, is lame. Religion without science is blind. 1954, Essays on Science and Religion. That's interesting, isn't it? Science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. And then back in 1934, this first quote's from 1934, some people divide Einstein's life in terms of what, what he did into before he was well known as, as a, a scientific genius and after. And so 54 would be after the fact and 34 would be before. Uh, he says, true value of human being is determined primarily by the measure and the sense in which he has attained liberation from self. Now, why, why do I want to bring that back in? Because that's purely a Buddhist thought. To be liberated from anything to do with who you, any identity. Buddhism, for the most part, is trying to, to not be an individual, but to remove the identity of the individual. Now, why is that dangerous in terms of meaning and purpose? Go ahead. No, go on. Each one of us has a purpose, and it's not all the same purpose, and we're not just a herd of cattle or sheep. Yeah. And, and God deals with us individually How about taking that mic back to fair and back there yeah. just take it back to him let him make it work. go ahead david well the um liberation from self uh, it's the self that you have a personal relationship with jesus yeah that's right you got christ christ's purpose in coming into this world was not um to deal with a culture, but to deal with the world as individuals. And so this leads us back, this very early thought of Einstein was a, really a very Buddhist thought to try to remove ourselves from any particular identity. Self, selflessness comes to my mind that he's saying selflessness the closer we get to selflessness or being unselfish is uh, that a possibility that maybe we're not the true value of human being is determined <laughs> primarily by the measure and the sense in which he has attained liberation from self to remove oneself to be liberated from an identity so I, I don't think that's what he's saying. I don't think he's talking about selflessness. I think that would have been easier said just like you said it than to deal with this. But he, this liberation, this, this idea of being free from self, you'll find in both Buddhism and Hinduism. And we'll talk about that tonight with, with regard to uh, reincarnation and what the purpose of reincarnation really is. Because that, that comes back to meaning as well. Okay, let's look at Buddhism since we're talking about it. Life, Buddhism says life is full of suffering. That is the universal truth of Buddhism. Suffering is brought about, Buddhists say, by our desires. We would have no suffering, the Buddhists say, if we didn't desire things, if we didn't have something we desired that we can't have. It's only in that desire that we, we find suffering. So what is the natural conclusion for the Buddhist? That desire is bad. Desire is bad. Do away with desire, do away with suffering. Okay? Is that the purpose of life, is just to do away with desire? It seems to be for the Buddhist. In fact, that's the core of Buddhism right there. If we do away with desire and we do away with, with anything that we might want to attain to, then we're going to do away with all suffering. And there's your purpose of life, do away with desire. If we could just do that, the Buddha says, 
will be okay. Let me, let me put it to you this way. Does God, anywhere in Scripture, tell us that we ought to have desires for some things? Yeah, absolutely. We, he, gives a, he, he wants us to desire his, um, his plan for our life. And therein lies our purpose. So if we're doing away with any desire whatsoever, including any spiritual desire, then we're doing away with everything that that has the potential to give us meaning. God wants us to understand that our life, our individual lives, every one of your lives has purpose. And that purpose is important to God. The Buddha says, do away with all desire, and your suffering ends, and that's, there in, there's your goal in life. Just, just figure out a way to do away with desire. Okay? We find true meaning in life, we must find a way to release ourselves from the cycle of pain and suffering. Letting go of desire helps us achieve happiness and enlightenment. So what are the end goals? Happiness. I see in the scriptures that that God says he wants us to have joy, but that's not the same thing as happiness, and it's certainly not the same thing as what they're talking about in terms of enlightenment. Enlightenment to the Buddhist is is the understanding that we that this whole cycle we just need if we want to be happy we got to escape from it. If we want to if we want to be happy, we need to escape from life in general. Okay? I, Some of this, I hope, will tie together in the end. Okay, let's look at Hinduism. According to Hinduism, the meaning and purpose of life is fourfold. To achieve these four things. Drama, Athra, Kama, and Moshka. The first means to act virtuously and righteously. That is, it means to act morally and ethically throughout one's life. Okay. However, this process also has a secondary aspect since Hindus believe that they are born in debt to the gods and other human beings. So this moral, it says that we are to act morally, but, but what's, what, what's moral? We're gonna, again, we're going to get to that next week, but they never define what morality is. It's just kind of an innate thing that we're supposed to know that that's good and this is good and this is bad and this is bad. But we're never told what those things are like we are in Scripture. In Scripture, we're told, here's the things you don't want to do. Bitterness, anger, wrath, immorality is, is all of those things. Immorality is sin. Immorality is sexual promiscuity. All of these things were given, but we're not given that here. He says we're to act these ways. Five different debts that follow, that follow, uh, and we're from parents and teachers, debts to guests, debt to other human beings, debt to all living beings. In other words, you're born with a debt, and your your pro- this whole process, this first process, is trying to eliminate the debt in your life. Okay, so there's your purpose: eliminate the debt. How do you do that? Do you see anything in there that tells you how to accomplish that? See, there, there's kind of an inherent problem there. The second meaning of Hinduism, of artha, which refers to the pursuit of wealth and prosperity in one's life. One must not step outside of moral ethical grounds in, in order to do so, in order to get wealth and prosperity, but we don't know what those moral grounds are that we have to step We have to stay within in order to achieve it, but we're supposed to get wealth and prosperity. So I'm I'm not going to go into the rest of these tonight. Liberation from is uh, liberation and purpose in this is is totally one thing, and that's to be released from this cycle of reincarnation. Now I used to think before I studied this that the purpose of reincarnation was just to hopefully have a better life next time than you had before. 
Both Hindus and Buddhists believe that there's a form of reincarnation. But that's not the purpose at all. The purpose is to find liberation from reincarnation. And what both Buddhists and Hindus believe is that to be released is to do nothing more than to end the cycle of reincarnation and just become one in the universe. We kind of evaporate into the universe. And in doing that, we don't have to live another life. The, the horrid thing for the, for the Hindu is not, not to have a, a life a, uh, after this life. The horrible thing is to have a life after this life. Even if you're bettering it, it's just you're doing this thing all over again, and their whole purpose is to get out of it. So purpose for Hindu is non-existence, is to evaporate into the universe. So what is their definition of unity with God? Because it would seem like once, from reading this, that once they've managed to um, not have to come back to this real life that the unity, I mean I see problems with this other stuff, I'm not mm -hmm. trying to be argumentative on no, that, I'm but, but going back into the universe um, if that's unity with God what, um, what do they Well, I, I purposely said unity with the universe because there's not really a good definition of God in Hinduism it is just kind of this God is uh, it's a pantheistic view. God is, God is the universe. God is everything. And so you're kind of melding back into this universe, this, this God state, which is non-existence. You, you, there is no, here again, it comes back to this individuality thing, that where you, you are no longer an individual. There, there is no individuality. You're melding back into becoming part of everything else. So you see a lot of the, the purpose in, in a lot of these different things comes back to releasing yourself from being an individual. And that's not at all what God desires of us. Now let me, let me make a statement here that I hope kind of grab and, and at least get a piece of. There, there's very much similarities to all of the things we're going to talk about tonight, and I think the reason that is is because they all come from a common source, and that is Satan himself. Which is Satan himself. So he can, uh, Satan can appeal to us through psychology, through uh, our, our ego, through our, our sense of uh, guilt over pride, individuality. And so what he's trying to do is tear apart everything God has given us that God says is important from Genesis forward. God gave you life in his image. Satan's objective is to take that away from you. Any individuality that you have, any spiritual gifts that you have, any talent that you have, any relationship with God that you have, anything that it comes back to you being an individual, the common theme in all of these things is to begin to tear them down and tear them apart and tear them away from you. That's not God's desire. And so anything, all these things which have this commonality have a common source, I believe, of Satan himself because they have the same end result. You don't exist anymore, become part of the universe, no relationship with God, no individuality, no love, no care, no honor. There's nothing there of any importance that God says is important. And so you all, in every one of these, this liberation from, from reincarnation is to say, I desire just not to exist. Annihilationism is just to not exist. That's what that means, just to not exist. And so the Hindu way of saying it is they become one in unity with God or unity with the universe. 
I don't I won't use God in the term in the in there that they use in this statement simply because our understanding of God is not at all what the Hindus are. Hindus' understanding of God is just that it's everything and everywhere and everyone. We're all part of it. And to be dissolved into it and not have to be an individual, that's the goal. So I'm, I'm trying hard, but I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind about this stuff tonight. So I think that because we also believe God is everything and everywhere and that. But in well, the difference here, let me, let me finish here on okay. this. Let me finish. Is that they see it as an it. And we see God's omnipresence as his person. Okay. Let me go back and just correct something that you said there. We do not believe that God is everything. That is a form of pantheism. We believe God is a being who is everywhere, but that doesn't mean he's everything. Okay, so we're, we're, we would never say that, that God is, is that chair and God is, you know, that's not, he, he's not everything in that sense. He is, he is a, a personal being who has the capacity because he is spirit, according to the book of John, to be everywhere, but that does not mean he's everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, wasn't it Jesus who created everything, the material things, the universe? And yes, all that? Jesus himself spoke of everything into existence. All right. Okay. So I'm not making the connection there. I don't know, it just came to me. Okay, yeah, well, th this is something that's really important that we, we as Christians separate the creation from God himself. Yeah. I, I think what I was thinking is that God, the individual, the person, if you will, I can't remember the term, is not everything to not create everything but jesus did the other persona of god the other yeah, person person of the trinity so i was yes. just trying to clarify yes yes gotcha okay so let's look at atheism just a minute i'm just trying to throw these out because i want you to see the common thread in all of these atheism and the meaning of life if god does not exist which atheists hold we find ourselves alone on, on the stage without a director. That's their way of putting it. We're, we're actors on a stage without a director. So we are self-directing. We have to come up with our own purpose and craft our own story. We have to figure out our own what really matters and what to fight for. What matters is the quality of our purpose, not the source of it. Isn't that interesting? So if you have a really good quality of purpose that you've generated for yourself, then that's sufficient. And it'll replace any purpose God has for you because that's what matters is not the source, it's the quality of the work, the quality of the mission. So if David's got a really good purpose for his life he's really thought about it and he's thought it out and he says this is my purpose in life and here's how i'm going to accomplish it and he's going about it and he's doing it really well and i don't i've never even thought about my own purpose then he is far superior to me because he's his quality of purpose is better even if my purpose came from god himself that's the end result yeah who defines the quality Exactly. Exactly. Who defines morals? Who defi these are the questions you've got to ask and every time you see one of these words. Who defines quality? Who defines moral acts? Who defines what is good? See, we keep, we keep, they keep throwing out these terms, but there is, there is no moral authority. 
There is no moral lawgiver. But they'll throw these terms out as if it's sufficient that we just have that in our, in our game plan. So is there objective purpose to be discovered in the universe? Or does it happen to be the case that life is ultimately purposeless? That's what the, the atheist is asking. Is life just without any purpose at all? And I think most, most atheists would come to the conclusion that it is without purpose, but it doesn't mean it has to be without purpose because we can create our own. This is why some people say, well, atheists, it doesn't mean atheists are not moral people. It's just that they, or that they don't live moral lives. They just have no objective uh, reason to live a moral life. Does that make sense? What we're getting back to here over and over again is we see these terms, as David pointed out, that are go on undefined, but what they're doing is trying to... Exp Why do atheists and psychologists and Hindus and Buddhists in every culture in the world, why are they looking for purpose for man? They don't want God's purpose. They don't want there to be a God. There does, they don't want there to be a God to answer to. Aldous Huxley wrote one of the Humanist Manifestos. I can't remember which, but he was one of the, he was one of the primary authors. The Humanist Manifesto. And, he, and uh, somebody asked him one time, says, well, why do you believe these things that, that we can live godless lives and that we ought to? And he says, because I prefer to live my life that way. See, it comes back to preference. I prefer not to think about there being purpose and meaning. I prefer not to, to have to deal with an authority. But we, but we as, as Christ followers, understand we have an authority to answer to. They are just saying we don't want to answer to it. If purpose means that for which we intentionally designed by an intelligent creator, then purpose does not exist. That's the atheist position. If purpose means it was created by an intelligent creator and given to us, then he says purpose does not exist. He he doesn't try to prove that. He just states it and says, well, because I stated it's true. It's like uh, Adolf Hitler said, if you say it loud enough and long enough, people will come to understand that it's true. Even if it's not, people will come to understand for their lives it's true. Just say it loud enough and often enough, and it becomes truth for people. Okay, so essentially they're saying purpose doesn't exist. Now here's, here's the last one of these before we get into scriptures for tonight. Atheism versus nihilism. Okay, what is nihilism? Atheism is merely the rejection of religion. But it reserves the right to establish some purpose for each individual to have their own purpose. Okay, nihilism does not reserve that right. Nihilism goes further to say that there is no meaning to our existence and we are just what we make ourselves to be, but it doesn't mean that we have any purpose at all. Nihilists, in other words, just say there's nothing of any meaning or purpose or good or bad or anything. So they're just, they're just carrying atheism to one degree further. Thoughts or questions concerning that? Yeah, because they presume there is no intelligent creator. See, that's an if statement. If purpose means that for which we are intentionally designed by a creator, then purpose does not exist. That's just the natural conclusion of being an atheist. They don't believe that God exists, therefore there is no purpose. 
Because if we believe that God gives us purpose, then it doesn't exist for the atheist. Okay. Yeah. So it's there's a it's an if then scenario. Yeah. Okay. Well, here's humanism. I I threw this in at the last minute. Humanism is an outlook or system of thought attaching prime importance to the human rather than any divine or supernatural being. So humanism just says that we as creatures on the earth are the most important thing. God is not, there is no God and therefore there is no, no importance in giving God any authority. And if human beings are the, are the most important thing, then that changes how you view everything, doesn't it? Okay, hum, humanist belief stresses the potential value and goodness of human beings. Again, never defines goodness and never defines value, but just says that that's potential value. It emphasizes the common human needs and seeks solely rational ways of solving human problems. In other words, if there is no God, no need to pray, no need to look for supernatural intervention, no need to depend on something of any higher authority, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and grow up. That's, that's where you are. In our humanistic culture, people pursue many things, thinking that in them they will find meaning. So isn't that true, though? I, I'm going to get really involved with this, and this will give my life purpose and meaning. You know, when, when we were raising my daughter, uh, we had horses, and Man, we went to horse shows and we groomed horses and we had horse, we had babies and we did all this stuff. Our lives revolved around horses. And in in the horse industry, uh, in particularly the Arab industry, because we had a stallion that made it to the championships of the state in North Carolina, people at least knew who what our who our farm was, because we had the state champion stallion. Our whole lives became around that. You can focus on anything. It can be it can be food. It can be uh, anything. I mean, even, even church without God leads you down this road. So we don't want to, we don't want to end up being the source of our, our being and the source of our happiness, the own, our own source, because it has no real purpose and meaning. Our humanistic culture, people pursue many things. It can be anything. Uh, success, wealth, Good relationships, sex, entertainment, doing good for others, good and bad things, and, and benign things. These things really don't make any difference. People have testified that while they achieved their goals and wealth, relationships, and pleasure, there was still a deep void inside, a feeling of emptiness that nothing seemed to fill. One of the best interviews that I ever heard of an entertainer was with Madonna, and Madonna was at her height, and she was having all kinds of success. It didn't seem like she could release a song that didn't go out, out of the sight. She was having all kinds of success, and, they, and when they were interviewing her, this is exactly what she said. It seems like, she said, it seems like my life is just empty. There's nothing worth anything in it. Seems like my life is just empty. Great success. Everybody wanting to interview her. Everybody wanting to have her on the show. Concerts sold out. My life has no purpose. It has no meaning. I'm empty. That's, that's the statement of the humanist and the uh, humanism. So if all of that is not the purpose of life, let's talk about what God's purpose is. Okay, let's look at from a Christian worldview. What is it? How can purpose, fulfillment, and satisfaction in life be found? How can something of lasting significance be achieved? So many people have never stopped to consider these important questions. And even people sitting in churches never think about their own individual purpose, particularly as it relates to what we were talking about last Sunday morning, how they fit into the body of Christ. Because that's what begins to give the Christ follower purpose. God gives you spiritual gifts. He equips you to, do, to serve. He places you in the body of Christ. 
and because your gift meshes up with somebody else's gift and it begins to create a, a work that has purpose and meaning that glorifies God, that brings your individual life purpose and, and, and brings an objective of being able to see the whole body work together. So many people never stop to consider that these are important questions for them, and, and particularly people even in the church. They look back years later and wonder why their relationships have fallen apart, why they feel so empty, even though they may have achieved what they set out to accomplish. An athlete who had reached the pinnacle in his sport was once asked if, if he wished someone would have told him when he first started uh, playing this sport. He says, he replied, I wish that somebody had told me that when I reach the top that there's nothing there. Emptiness. Total success, emptiness. Many goals revealed their emptiness only after years have been wasted in their pursuit. So why are these things important? Because people can get so caught up in whether it's in any of these religions or philosophies or anything else, we get so caught up chasing these things that have no mural meaning. Like somebody said, I was climbing the ladder of success and only after I got to the top did I realize it was leaned against the wrong wall. No real purpose in it. I got there, but no real... Why are these things important? Because God has a purpose for you. God has meaning for your life that is relevant, that, that has value, real value. And that value can be measured on God's standard. If we don't, if we don't uh, even think about these things, or if we just let, let ourselves drift into a Hinduistic kind of thought process or a, an atheist kind of thought process that says you have no real purpose, then you've missed all of life. Your life does have purpose. It does have meaning. You, you do have value to the kingdom of God. And what he has gifted you with, he desires for you to use for his kingdom. The author of the biblical book, Ecclesiastes, describes the feeling when he says, meaningless, meaninglessness, uh, vanity, vanity, some of your translations will say, utter vanity, everything is vanity, Ecclesiastes 1-2. King Solomon, the writer of Ecclesiastes, had a wealth beyond measure, wisdom beyond any man of, it, of his time. Hundreds of women in his palace that were his concubines and wives Palaces and gardens, envy of kingdoms and the best food and wine, every kind of form of entertainment. He said at one point that anything his heart wanted, he pursued. Yet, he summed up life under the sun as vanity, meaninglessness, purposelessness, nothingness. Why is there such a void is the question. In every one of these philosophies, every one of these other religions, where, where we're just throwing out terms without any definition attached to them, why in the end do people get all the way to the end of what people call success only to find this emptiness? And many people sitting in churches today will get all the way to the end of their life and find meaninglessness. It's not, it's not confined to these. People who are Christians that never employ themselves for God's work, never put themselves out there for his kingdom, will find their life just as empty in the end because God had a purpose for them. It doesn't mean they're not going to heaven. It doesn't mean that they don't have a relationship with Christ. It simply means that this life was empty because they didn't choose to use that which God had given them and choose to follow the purpose God had given them. And what I and I think most pastors want for for, their, for people in their church is to come to find that purpose and to follow it and to find their joy in that purpose. Solomon said of God, he has also set eternity in the hearts of men. He has set eternity in the hearts of men. There is purpose, there is eternal purpose. The purpose, in other words, what he is saying here, our purpose doesn't end like some goal we achieve. Okay, I, I want to get to where I can 
score 500 in darts. And so I score 500 in darts and I'm through. I remember I had this, uh, this guy that I used to play tennis with. And it, every time we played, he beat me. Every time. I mean, I, I, was, just, I was just fodder for his cannon. He, he would tear me up. Finally, one time I beat him, and I said, I'm through. You know, I've reached my goal. I'm not putting myself on the line anymore. I'm finished. And what he's saying is a lot of people are like that in their life. They go, I finished the physical goal I had. Therefore, I'm finished. There wasn't any real purpose. There not. My purpose was just to win one game. And once I did, I was finished. God is saying there is an eternal purpose in your life, an eternal purpose, that the things you do now will have eternal consequences. People that come to know the Lord, people that, are, that, that come to serve the Lord with their, with their whole lives, uh, those, are, those are eternal consequences. So let's go to Genesis. Genesis, the first book of the Bible, we found that God created mankind in his image this means that we are more like god than we are like anything else uh, any other life form that is we also find that before mankind fell into sin and the curse of sin became uh, came upon the earth the following things were true number one god made man a social creature we were meant to engage with one another god gave man work to do he had purpose in the work that he was doing in the garden, it says he, he, he tilled and kept it. Uh, those, the, the original Hebrew words means to praise and worship. His purpose was to bring worship, service to God. God intended for each of these to add to the fulfillment in life, but all of these, especially man's fellowship with God, were adversely affected by man's fall into sin and resulting curse on the earth. Part of what, we're, what we do as Christ followers is that we're constantly in, a, in the process, as we are being sanctified, of reclaiming something of ourselves in the garden. Reclaiming something of our relationship with God. Because as we are being sanctified, we're learning to walk more and more without the sin in our everyday life. And we are, we are regaining that relationship with God that that we've never experienced and it only was experienced by Adam and Eve in the garden. So that sanctification process, which is being done as we are serving God. Now think about this just a minute. You all wake up with me here. How, how can we become more sanctified without, without serving God? Is sanctification just a natural byproduct of living? No. It is only as we come together and we begin to serve God together that we find our lives being sanctified and we find out that, it, that indeed we do have an eternal purpose. When you see that first person that you share Christ with, maybe you've shared Christ with 5,000 people, but the first one you share Christ with that makes a decision for Christ and you realize that had eternal consequences. the investments you make back into people when, it, when it's hard to do. The real meaning of life both now and in eternity is found in the restoration of a relationship with God that was lost by Adam and Eve, the fall to sin in the garden. That relationship with God is, is only possible through his son, Jesus Christ, Acts 4.12, John 1.12, and John 14.6. Salvation and eternal life are gained when we trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. Once that salvation is received by faith, Christ changes us, making us new creatures and new creation. We begin the progressive journey of growing closer to him and learning to rely on him. In other words, our purpose is inextricably tied to our salvation. Our purpose, is, if our purpose is set by God before the foundation of the, of the earth, which is what the Bible tells us. 
Our purpose and meaning is set before the foundation. Before God ever created anything, he knew you, Kenny Wallen. He knew everything about you, and he knew he was giving you purpose. And he knew he was going to give your life meaning. He knew from the outset that he was. And then he, he says, but it, it comes about and begins to take form only after we make a decision for Jesus Christ. Only after that time can we begin to, to experience God's purpose for us. Until then, we're told in the Bible that we are aliens from him, that we are sinners separated from him, and until we have salvation, we can't even have that relationship with God. So our purpose comes back and begins with our salvation. Why... why Why is so much of our work here at the church in in doing outreach to other people? To, to, To the assisted living, to the mission, to the prison, to the people on the street. Why is why is that true? Because that's where we begin to find people that can begin that walk because of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if they don't have that relationship, we can offer that to them. But we can't we can't do that absent. A relationship with Christ. We can't do it and we can't offer it to anybody. Real meaning in life is not found only in the acceptance of Christ as Savior, as wonderful as that is. Rather, real meaning in life is when one begins to follow Christ as a disciple of His. I can say... um, I'm saved, it's signed, sealed, and delivered, I need not do anything else. And I, and I, might, I may have my ticket to heaven, but the life that God planned for me with purpose and meaning can still go unfulfilled if I, if I just stop there or I reject him doing what he's, he desires to do in my life. My purpose and meaning may be nothing more than coming alongside of one person. It might be nothing more than, you know, when, when we first church I ever pastored, uh, I was going to take a group to Africa. And the church had a, a, an abundance of money, had over $700,000 in the bank. But they wouldn't pay for, the, for this one little orphan boy trip to Africa, and he desperately wanted to go. And that, and that trip, by the way, changed his life. I had to go out as a pastor and raise the funds doing bake sales for that little boy to go with us to Africa because they weren't going to send him. What if that was the only thing I'd ever accomplished in my whole life? Would my life have had purpose? You bet. If that was it, I would have had purpose. Why? Because it brought him into a deeper relationship with God and it brought him to a place of of being more effective with children in Africa than I could have ever been. He was just a a preteen. And I had him preaching messages to young people, to children, and, and hundreds of children getting saved at this young man's messages. Was it valuable? Yeah. I mean, what, what if that was it? Oh, well, that would, have been, that would have been a life well spent. Real meaning in life is when one begins to follow Christ as his disciple, learning from him, spending time with him in his word, communing with him in prayer, and walking with him in obedience to his commands. Just being faithful. So, here's the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Question. What is the chief end of man? The child's response that I learned to give in the Presbyterian Church, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. There it is in a nutshell. Then our purpose, that's our big picture purpose our purposes then are refined by the gifts and the talents and abilities and the the 
the, uh, the assets God has given you to steward. That's where all of this comes together. But that's the big picture. So when I keep t- asking you, what is the chief end of man? Is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And here's my, here's my, my premise to this. I think that, I believe that if you are genuinely glorifying God in the way he created you to glorify him, if that's the case, you will be enjoying him forever. If the way he created you with the talents and abilities and the things he's given you to steward, if you're using those for the glory of God in the way the Bible defines glorifying God, then you will be enjoying him forever. And if you are not doing that, then you're going to have a struggle enjoying him forever. Why? Because we're not in sync with how he created us and what he's given us. Right? So would you say so far that Christians have purpose? Okay. Can you begin to see how this comes together a little bit? Okay, some biblical commands to pursue our joy in God. Here's just a few scriptures. All of these are from the Psalms, but I wanted you to see them. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart, Psalm 34, 37. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart, Psalm 32. Sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. We've talked about righteousness last Sunday morning. We'll be again this Sunday morning. O you righteous ones, praise is becoming to the upright. Praise is becoming to those first people who are upright in their, in their stature, in their countenance. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. You will judge the peoples with uprightness and guide the nations on the earth. Your, your life will have purpose and you'll bring leading, leadership and guidance to whole groups of people, indeed nations of people, if that's who we are. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joy and singing, Psalm 100. All of these are expressions, listen to me very carefully, all of these are expressions of praise and worship that come as a direct result of having purpose and meaning given to us by God being fulfilled in our lives. As we are fulfilling the very calling of our lives, we are finding ourselves delighting ourselves in the Lord, being glad and rejoicing in the Lord, singing joy to the Lord, affecting nations of people because of we are being faithful to what God has called us to do. Okay, a couple of things to be... There's always wonderful things to say about what God says is our purpose there. Let's talk about the biblical thread if we will not pursue the, our joy in God. Here is Deuteronomy 28, 47. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and glad heart for the abundance of all things, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you. That's pretty staunch warning. Uh, Jeremiah 2. Here is the... Um, The essence of sin and evil is to pursue satisfaction outside of God. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that our only true satisfaction, our only true fulfillment is the word that I use most often, is found in the fact that we are serving God and finding our joy in Him. It says, Be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder. Be very desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now what's he saying? I am the well that you need to draw from. I am the one that will give you that water to drink. I am the one that will fulfill and quench your thirst, your spiritual thirst. I am the one, and I have given this to you. The two evils are you have forsaken me. You've given up 
the well that I've given you. What is the well? It is your, your, your calling, your gifts, your abilities, your, your stewardship. All of those things you have abandoned, he says, that's the living water, the fountain of living water. And now you've tried to recreate those wells, those cisterns, out of stuff in the world and find satisfaction in them. You've hewn out cisterns for, for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no real water. So here's our problem. There's the very definition of all that we started with tonight. Psychology today, Hinduism, Buddhism, atheism, humanism, all of those isms. What are they? They are, they are attempts to carve out broken wells for ourselves that genuinely can hold no water. They can't, they can't ever quench our thirst. And so we try to substitute humanly created broken cisterns, he says, instead of going back to the well that he has gifted us that is perfect. <clears throat> so here's the question again. We're going to end with this tonight. The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. We can never, ever, ever find genuine, ongoing enjoyment of God in an ongoing basis outside of the fact that we are fulfilling the call to bring him glory. Now, the glory of God, let, let, me, let, let me end tonight with a, with a deeper thought I want you to think about. Because here's, here's the problem, I think, that goes un, unstated sometimes. <clears throat> and I actually had one guy that actually asked me this one time, but, but it's one of those questions that kind of goes more unasked than asked. So why does God need our, our praise and worship? Why does he need us to serve him? Isn't that just egotistical of God? that he would want us to praise and worship him with our lives and, and give to him and to... Isn't that just an ego trip? So here's the question I would pose to you. Why does God desire this service from us and this worship of him? Does he need it? So why, do, why does he desire? Why does he tell us to come, continue to come to him and worship and serve him? We need it. It's what we were made for. It's what we were made for, but why do that to begin with? Why create us if that's our purpose to bring him worship, glory? If he doesn't need it. We're supposed to have a relationship with him. And that's part of it. Okay. And part of our design. But God doesn't need our relationship. He doesn't need anything of us. So I'm asking from God's perspective, why? Okay, he wants it. Why does he want it? That's where, that gets to a better question. Yeah, David. It's kind of analogous to us and our children. We don't need their obedience. We don't need them uh, honoring us. But we want them to do that because... We love them. And okay, we because we love the because is in there are because we love them. Okay. All right. You have something? He wants what is best for us, us Farron says. Okay, let, let me let me give you a really high thought, but but that I think answers this question. Why does God call on us to serve him when he doesn't need us to serve him? to give to him when he doesn't need us to give. He owns, the he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns everything. He's just made us stewards over it. To serve him by going out and telling others, why does he do that? To worship him. I've al already said the last several weeks, worship is service. That's the same word. Worship and service, the same thing. Why does he do that? Here's the answer. Listen very carefully. Because it is right. Right. 
it is right that we as creatures worship our Creator. It is righteousness that causes God to desire to be worshipped because it is the right thing to have happen. He doesn't need it, but because he is righteous and he desires everything that is righteous, the fact that we ought to and we, that it is right that we worship him, that, is, that in and of itself is the reason God has given us the call to continue to serve and worship him. It is the right thing, and he is, a, he is the supreme righteous cre- uh, being. So since we're going down the road of questions I've always been afraid to ask, <laughs> so, uh, and to me it's kind of a little bit of a logical follow to this, since he doesn't need us, or anything from us, why did he even choose to create us in the first place? Mankind. Same in the first answer. Place? Because it is right that he be worshipped, and the, and the creature, us, uh, are the ones that will worship him and bring that rightness into being. He is not self worshipping, he doesn't need our worship, but it is right that he be worshipped. And therefore, creation, our being, ought to be able to bring him glory. And, and because he created us for that purpose, and we are fulfilled in that purpose, then we will find enjoyment in him forever as we are doing that. And until we do that, until we are fulfilling that role, we never will find that fulfillment in life that purpose for which we were created. And every one of us are, are created as individuals. And every one of us as individuals are called to worship and serve him. And as he brings us together, that fulfillment will bring fulfillment to the whole and it will bring fulfillment to the individual. Why? Because he created every one of us different for a purpose and our, and our form of worship is very different. But it is right that we do that. It is his righteousness that demands that. Does any of that make sense, David? I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm having a hard time getting my head around that. Um, because it being right, now, I know God is the one who decides what is right. But there's no real definition there. And because he demands it, I, that I don't feel like that answers the question. Okay, go to go me. back to what you just said. There, there was no definition to what? To right. I mean, okay. God decides what is right and what isn't, but so his, I, I just can't well, get my head is, around that answer. What is right? When we talk about God's righteousness, all we're saying is that that is his rightness. He is righteous in all that he does, but all we're saying in that is that that act, whatever righteousness is, leads to that which is right. Okay? It is right that a God who is all-powerful, who is all-loving, who, uh, who knows everything, uh, it is right that that God should be worshipped. And because of that, the chief end of man, which our purpose lies in, is to bring him glory because, simply because it's the right thing. So the big picture is that it is right that God be worshipped. If there are no creatures, there is no worship. He created us for a purpose the big picture being to bring him glory. The small picture is that we fulfill the purpose and the calling and the gifting that he's given us so that the whole will create and give him glory. But all of that is simply because it is right. He 
He doesn't need it. He only desires it because it is right. He doesn't desire it for an egotistical point of view. He's not desiring it because his ego needs it. He desires it because it's right. It's a righteous thing. It seems like it's something we wouldn't even have to think about had we not been separated from him in the beginning. And everything essentially is a distraction from God's purpose, including finding our purpose is to, you know, Satan, his whole get down is to get us away from that. Yes. In any way, shape, or form, and that's just another way of distracting us. Yeah, and let's go back to what I, the point I made just a little while ago, the, the Genesis account, where he said he, he put man in the garden to tend and keep it, to tend and keep it. Those two words are actually worship and serve in the Hebrew. To worship and serve, or worship and praise him so in serving him in the garden intending and keeping whatever that was in the garden was bringing glory to god the tending and keeping was bringing glory to god that's before the fall before sin he put him in the garden for that purpose he put us here for this purpose to reach out to this community let me just ask you this If we don't do that, who's going to? If we don't do that as a church, who's going to do that? We're supposed to do it, but if God wants it done and we don't do it, someone else will. Well, His providence will see that those that are meant to be reached are reached. Who suffers if we don't do it? Us, exactly. It goes right back to the, the statement before. It's us that suffers. He's given us this grand opportunity, this grand mission. And he, his, his will is going to be accomplished. He already knows how it's going to be accomplished. The, the question is, will we do what we're called to do? Because it's Right. All right, let's pray. Father God, I thank you tonight that uh, you have given us meaning and purpose in this life that is intertwined with a relationship with you and with one another. I pray, Lord, tonight that you will give us a sense of direction, a sense of purpose and meaning in life that unlike the world does not end with the worldly success of emptiness but ends with grand purpose in bringing you glory and in that we find the opportunity to enjoy you forever. Help us, Lord, to do just that, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.